Hello everyone, welcome to Agora. This is the English podcast version of the Spanish speaking radio show I do weekly. This is your host Gabriel Andrade from Maracaibo, Venezuela. And joining me on the other end of the line is Dr. Bruce Chilton. He's a historian of early Christianity. Hi Bruce, welcome. Thank you very much. We're going to be talking about James, the brother of Jesus. You are uh, an authority in this issue, and uh, it's always interesting for people who are looking for the history of early Christianity to, to focus on this figure. Now, among conventional believers, and especially among Catholics, there is the idea that the real successor of Jesus was Peter. Uh, in as much as he says, you know, uh, upon this rock I will build my church and apostolic succession and so on. But you historians tell a different story. You say, well, yeah, Peter was one, but he was not the prime leader. The prime leader was actually Jesus' own blood, his brother James. Now, uh, how can you convince uh, conventional believers who think that's not the way? Because when you go to the Vatican, and this happened to me, I mean, I had read some of your books, And I look up there and I see, upon this rock I will build my church. And I'm saying, hmm, that's, I mean, yeah, certainly that's in the Gospels. I don't know if that happened historically or not. But, I mean, that really conveys the idea that the real successor was Peter. And historically, the more I read uh, this type of thing in the books, like with authors like you and many others, it became clear to me that uh, Peter was not really the first leader. Now, how can you convince uh, Uh, conventional folks that uh, your version is the the real one and not the the pious one it's an excellent question and the answer to it is to bring people's attention to the actual historical sources that we have at our disposal and this tells us about the way in which early Christianity began after the time of the resurrection during that period very center of attention for all Jews throughout the world was Jerusalem and particularly the temple. The New Testament makes it very clear that the head of the community of believers in Jerusalem was James, the brother of Jesus. So the short answer to your question is that we just have to bring attention conventional believers to the 15th chapter of the book of Acts of the Apostles. And they would consider that, they will see very clearly that all of the other followers, including Peter and Paul and Barnabas, accepted the authority of James. Right. So who was James? Because you say, I mean, in, in uh, the Apostle Paul, and I think the Acts of the Apostles always calls him uh, the brother of Jesus or the brother of the Lord. Now, the Catholic dogma, I'm only speaking here for Catholics, not for Protestants, but the Catholic dogma is that the vir uh, Mary was a perpetual virgin. And in that sense, uh, Jesus could not have had the uh, blood brothers. So the traditional interpretation, and I think this goes back to Jerome, is that uh, these were not really brothers, but rather cousins. Um, what do you think about that? I mean, was Jerome right? What you say is exactly right in the sense that uh, St. Jerome, who in his own time was a great Bible scholar, uh, saw that the word brother uh, was used to James to describe James' relationship to Jesus. And Jerome observed Actually, the term brother might not be used in a precise sense of a sibling, and so perhaps it would be better to think of them as being cousins. Uh, the difficulty with that point of view is that today we have a lot more linguistic data about how Greek language is used in the first century, and the whole New Testament is written in Greek. And that was a very interesting between others and cousins. What's even more important is that there is a passage in the Gospel according to Mark in which the people of Jesus' hometown refer to his brothers. 
they name Jesus' brothers as being James and Joseph and Simon and Judas. There's a question, but that you're dealing with people who have a direct acquaintance to the family and identifying Jesus in his relationship with the family. Now, having said that, that is a large number of brothers. And the Gospel, according to Mark, also refers to Jesus having sisters. It doesn't name them, so we don't know how many. But it seems most unlikely that all of those children would have been the product of one single marriage. You know, the birth rates in antiquity did not overall lead to that number of adult children. So, from time of the second century, from a very early period, has been suggested that Joseph had children from a previous marriage whom he brought into his relationship with Mary. This would account uh, for the large number of children referred to in our gospel. But why doesn't the gospel uh, explicitly say so, that these other people, these, other, these so-called brothers were Joseph's sons but not Mary's? It doesn't say so because the Gospels are not filled with a great deal of biographical detail. Uh, their concern is to explain how it is what Jesus did and said reflected the way in which God was operating with humanity. And therefore, there is an enormous amount of background information which the Gospels don't tell us. For example, they don't tell us when Joseph died exactly, but he simply disappears from the accounts when Jesus is in early puberty. They don't tell us where Mary came from exactly. There are enormous gaps of information because the Gospels are not written as being modern biographies, and therefore, in historical work, what it is necessary to do is to read the Gospels in the context of their time, to take account of archaeological evidence, when that's available, and also to consider the possibilities raised by other early literature. So, for example, in what I just said about uh, Joseph having two families, that appears in a document called the Infancy Gospel of James, which was written during the second century of the Common Era. Now, a second century source, obviously, is later than the New Testament. You just can't take these things at face value. But sometimes they give us information which, it turns out, helps us to account for what we read in the canonical Gospels. Right, but this, this infancy Gospel of James uh, has some rather fantastic stuff. For instance, uh, there comes a shepherd to check if Mary is actually a virgin or not, and as far as I remember the world stops when Jesus is born. I think that's in the infancy of, of in the infancy Gospel of James. And, you know, someone would say, I mean, this is not credible at all. I mean, this has no historical value. So if we're not willing to accept that a shepherd came to check if uh, Mary was a virgin, and if we're not willing to accept that the world was stopped when Jesus was born, why should we accept that Joseph uh, had previous sons? I mean, it seems that it's as fantastical as the other stories. This is a wonderful question because it illustrates exactly what historians need to do whenever they read ancient religious sources. Uh, this is true of the infancy Gospel of James. You're quite right. It has fantastic elements in it. So do the Gospels. Uh, so do the religious scriptures of all religions of which we're aware and the reason for that is that these scriptures are a deliberate combination of what is actually remembered about figures from the past and what the significance of those figures is held to be. Uh, that's why, for example, in the Gospel according to Matthew, there is reference to an earthquake at the time of the crucifixion of Jesus. As far as we know from other sources... That did not occur, but it conveys the feeling that the author and his readership had for what the significance of the crucifixion was. 
we read the gospel according to Matthew, aware that some of its material is going to be symbolic, and some of it is going to reflect good historical information. Generally speaking, uh, that's also our attitude to other sources when we read them. Another example of this is the Gospel according to Thomas, which also comes from the second century. I would not for a moment suggest that everything in the Gospel according to Thomas is historical, but it does have elements within it which are very helpful when they're read in association with what we have from the canonical Gospels. Right. So if I get you correctly, you're saying, well, it's possible to separate the sheep from the goat, to use the parable from Jesus, uh, in, when it comes to the uh, infancy gospel of, of James. I mean, we don't have to believe in, in the verification of uh, the virgin and so on, but we can accept that Joseph had a previous, uh, uh, had uh, uh, children from a previous marriage. That part at least is believable. Exactly, that's right, because that's a case where What James is saying helps us to explain facts which we know from elsewhere. And we can't think of any reason why the infancy gospel of James would want to invent a previous marriage. Right. Well, but, but, but what about, I mean, this, this is what some critics say. Well, but the gospel of James does have the intention to prove the perpetual virginity. And in that sense, it, it invents that story to account for the fact that uh, Jesus apparently had brothers when in fact they were only half brothers. I mean, he, he does have, uh, apparently he does have some bias towards their perpetual virginity. So maybe this story was made up to cover that fact. It could conceivably have been used for that purpose. On the other hand, another one of the major concerns of the infancy gospel of James is to insist upon the purity and the integrity of all the actors. Uh, Joseph included. If someone had wanted to invent a story which really confirmed the developing idea of Mary being perpetually a virgin, then they would have gone in the direction of St. Jerome right. and say, those weren't brothers at all. Oh. And as you say, there is much within the infancy gospel of James which is invented It would have been very easy to invent that right, if right. it wanted to. Actually, from its perspective, the idea of the two families introduces a complication. So you have to ask the question, why complicate a story? Right. When you could have told the legend that really made it accord with what you want people to believe. Whenever an historian runs across a story that complicates the overall narrative... The suspicion is it's likely to have been an historical reminiscence, which right. the people who composed this gospel simply had to take on board and explain that they, right. they weren't simply inventing this. Of course, this is the so-called criterion of uh, embarrassment, right? That's what you people yes, call it. Yes, exactly. That's, that's precisely the case. That's usually called the criterion of embarrassment. It's also known as the criterion of dissimilarity. Right, right, right. Uh, that is when a, an idea comes up and it really doesn't accord with later church teaching, all other things being equal, it's likely to have been historical. Right. Among you historians, there is this idea that uh, there was sort of a rivalry between James and the Apostle Paul. Now, I say among you historians because in conventional belief, It's all part of like a dream team where all people got together and, you know, there were no quarrels. And if there were any quarrels, they were settled at the Council of Jerusalem. But the chronology, the New Testament chronology, uh, is not that. After the Council of Jerusalem, apparently, uh, Paul has a very nasty incident with uh, Peter at Antioch. And the text says, I think this is Galatians, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the text says that uh, Peter was sent there by James. So, in effect, what the narrative appears to be presenting is that uh, the quarrel was not so much with Peter, but with Peter's boss, who happens to be James. Now, tell us a little bit about this rivalry. I mean, how intense was it, and was it ever settled? It was the most intense controversy within the early church. And as is the case with many controversies which are passionate, it began with agreement 
among Paul and Peter and James, but then it wound up in disagreement. Uh, the part that they agreed on was that it would be possible for non-Jews to become members of the circle of believers simply by being baptized, that there would not be any requirement of male circumcision put on believers coming in to this movement. Now, that by itself was actually a radical decision. And it's important to stress that Paul and Peter and James all agreed on that basic proposition. They all did, but there were others in the church who profoundly disagreed. No. To insist that... Sorry, go ahead. But, but why did James change his mind then? I mean, if they had an agreement... Why did later on Peter refuse to eat at the same table? And why did James have no enthusiasm for the incorporation of Gentiles? I mean, as far as I read the narrative, it seems to me here that the one that didn't keep his word was James. Because, I mean, Paul was doing what was agreed on at the Council of Jerusalem. It seems like James uh, did not follow his initial promise. Well, how, how, do you, how, how do you evaluate the, this situation? You, you have the impression that James did not keep his word because you're only reading Paul's side of the story. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to see James' side of the story, then you want to turn to the book of Acts, chapter 15. And what you can see there is that having begun with agreement, all right, no circumcision, the two men understood that agreement in different ways. You know, we all see that happen in international relations. It happened in the early church. The way Paul understood this, if you let non-Jews into the church by means of baptism, that meant in Paul's mind that they all became Israel. They all were part of the people of God so that there was no real distinction between Jews and Gentiles. James didn't go that far. He, James agreed that Gentiles would enter into the church by means of baptism, but in his mind, they were still Gentiles, which meant that as an observant Jew, you would not take meal with them in the way that Paul wanted believers to do. And this whole matter came to a head in Antioch, because Antioch was a largest city in the Greco Roman world. There were large numbers, non Jewish believers in Jesus there. Therefore, for the first time, you could see the possibility of there being a parity between Jews and Gentiles inside the church. It wasn't just a matter of letting a few Gentiles in, it could see them be a majority part of this movement. Now, Paul was on the side of saying, we're going to be authority, and we must have a complete table fellowship with one another. James was on the side of saying, no, in fact, the historic identity of Israel has to be preserved. Even though we let Gentile to the movement, we don't treat them as if they were Israelites. So you had two very clear very well-formed and sincere positions, but Paul and James were directly opposed. And right in the middle, there was Peter. Right. caught trying to compromise, and in the way of moderate, he found himself hacked by the side. Right. We're about to close, uh, Dr. Sheldon, but one final thing. Uh, there are some historians, I don't remember if in your books you mentioned this, but I'd like you to comment. There are some historians that say that this rivalry got so intense that mm, they suspect that James could have been behind Paul's arrest in Jerusalem. Um, do you find any guilt in James behind all this affair? What I would say is that James in Jerusalem was maintaining his usual position of his complete loyalty to the temple and the way that sacrifice in the temple should be run. When Paul came to Jerusalem for his final visit there, 
he wished to make an offering inside the temple, and James told Paul how to do that. He explained to him that he should go into the temple and present several Jews who had already been prepared to make what was called a Nazarite vow. That was a special devotion to the temple. When Paul went in, there was a false rumor that he was going in with non-Jews. Now, you can understand why this false rumor developed. It developed because people knew what Paul's overall position was. They thought he was trying to enact it. There was a riot in the temple, and ultimately that led to Paul's arrest and finally his death. Right. I personally don't believe that James set Paul up, I've that said. But I think it is true that James was obviously more concerned about the temple than he was about the safety of Paul. I think that had he been more concerned about Paul's safety, he would have acted in a different way. Right. Yeah, because I mean the the book of Acts tells us that the temple the gate the gates of the temple were closed and I mean it seems as if uh, James didn't have much interest in in saving this man's life. One final thing and this is the real final thing. <laughs> Um, how come Pauline Christianity uh, became prevalent, whereas Jamesian Christianity did not? I mean, you and I are Gentiles. I don't suppose you're a Jew. I, I, I suppose you're a Christian very, very much as I am, at least a, a cultural Christian. Uh, we're not required to be circumcised. Uh, we don't eat kosher and so on. I mean, Christianity was finally split from Judaism, which was opposed to James' initial idea, in, in as much as he was a true Jewish Christian. I mean, he wanted to keep the Moses law. Uh, if James, if Paul was arrested and you know he couldn't continue preaching and so on, um, and James uh, was not arrested, although he was later killed. How come Christianity became Pauline and not Jamesian? It is a remarkable turnaround. During the first century, Paul was very much in a minority. Uh, he was at loggerheads with James. He disagreed with Peter. He even separated from Barnabas, who was the one who had introduced him into the circle of the apostles. But in the second century... Christians read his letters, and they start to call Paul the apostle, as if he's the preeminent one. I think the reason for this is, by the second century, Paul had the constituency that he had been aiming for while he was alive, but never achieved. There was, in fact, a majority Gentile church. And this also meant that James began to go into eclipse for demographic reasons. But in addition to that, just what we were talking about at the very beginning of our conversation, you had the emerging idea of Mary being perpetually virgin. And therefore, it seemed better on the whole for James simply to be forgotten. Right. And that's So, but was was it some sort of conspiracy? I mean, in the sense that, you know, the Pauline Christians got together and let's say, well, let's erase Jane's memory or, I mean, how innocent was it? Uh, how spontaneous was it? Or was there like an organized conspiracy to put James away or on his memories? I don't think that there was an organized conspiracy uh, in the early centuries of the Christian movement. Uh, however, by the time... In the fourth century and later, James represents an entire position of Judaism, which leaders of the church obviously did with the race. The idea that we as Christians have brought an historic and connection with Judaism was something that the leaders of the church after the fourth century wanted to deny. And that is one of the reasons which you see the rise of anti-Semitism during the course of the Middle Ages. Right. Now, Jewish Christians survive up until the 5th or 6th century, right? I mean, and, and there's the Sedu Clementine literature, and there are the Nazarenes and so on. But, I mean, they are not around today. Now, sociologically speaking, do you see any chance that in America or in Europe there might be a new movement of Christians uh, 
that want to go back deep into the roots of Judaism while remaining Christians. I mean, we all heard of uh, Jews for Jesus and, and Messianic Jews and so on. Mm -hmm. But these are, you know, very much fringe groups. Uh, do you see any prospect that in the future uh, some streams of Christianity might want to go deeper into Judaism and maybe um, get together again with uh, some of Moses' law and so on? I think that we are seeing moves in that direction. Um, part of Christians within the mainline tradition, there's a new newness to Judaism. What I found very interesting is that among fundamentalist Christians, there is an awakening interest in the figure of James. Mm -hmm. And that could have quite a catalytic effect. And then also, uh, I agree with you that historically speaking, the movement generally called Jews for Jesus has started as a kind of marginal enterprise. It's become increasingly important, and also we're beginning to see some scholarship produced from that end. So these are different streams coming together, and I believe that we might see a reawakening of the living sense of Judaism inside of Christianity. Dr. Bruce Chilton, thank you very much for receiving this call. That was Bruce Chilton, author of uh, many books, many of which I enjoyed, especially Rabbi Jesus and Abraham's Curse. Any means of contact for our, our listeners if they want to contact you and read your books? Uh, well, let me see. What would be the best thing that they could do? Uh, yes, if they wanted to contact me directly, say, by email. I have the simplest email in the world. It's just Chilton, C-H-I-L-T-O-N, at Bard, B-A-R-D, dot E-D-U. All right. Thank you very much indeed. My pleasure. Good talking to you. <laughs>